discussing. Uh, this is kind of like a crash course in understanding REST with a focus on um, things like concepts, understanding URIs, verbs, status codes, headers, things like that. Um, come on, mouse, play nice. Like before this talk, if you've ever done anything with APIs um, and you've heard people talk about like REST, Hypermedia, Hadios, understanding the, the plethora of status codes out there, trying to figure out put versus patch, what cores is, um, why GraphQL may be the coolest thing ever, what open API is. You might have felt like these cyclists right here after a pretty gnarly crash, just massive headache, and you're just over this whole thing. After this talk, I hope that you kind of come around looking like this guy, just crushing up this uh, massive hill, um, able to take on just about any sort of REST challenge that comes your way and understanding how the headers interact with the APIs, how the, the codes work in a certain different way, things like that. So that's our goal here today. Um, so like I said, what we're recessing things like API contracts and tooling, uh, headers, status codes, and things like that. And most importantly, is really I want people to leave this talk um, not feeling like REST is as complicated as we like to make it to be. Um, and I'm certainly guilty of that. I have definitely thrown out concepts and topics and things like that that make REST a lot more complicated than it really should be. But ultimately, it's a fairly straightforward concept once you get past a few little uh, hurdles. So first, a little bit of background information, though. And I like GIFs, and I'm a huge Star Wars nerd, so I like using things like uh, R2-D2 here. Um, we should really kind of define, like, what is REST? Um, and the best way to kind of talk about what REST is, um, is this REST period, pyramid of greatness that I like to throw around. Um, REST stands for something called represent, representational state transfer. And theoretically, there's four different levels of REST APIs. Starting with level zero, uh, we have what's called the swamp of POX, POX standing for plain old XML. Uh, if this is a talk in person, I would ask for hands to see like who has ever sent or received requests or responses in XML form. Um, XML is definitely one of those, you either really love it or you really don't love it. There's really no in between of XML. Uh, but back in the old days, uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, XML was the main type of data transfer object. And so really there's just people passing around massive XML objects um, with no real kind of unity or conformity to a certain type of concept. Level one is resource-based URIs. So if you think about... Um, your actions, you might have like a slash API slash get slash users, API slash create slash users, API slash update slash users, where we're kind of building towards uh, representational state transfer and um, better formed URIs, but we're not totally there yet. We're still kind of showing the actions of what we're doing in the URL instead of hiding it in the uh, request headers. Level two, we're finally taking advantage of those verbs, the puts, the put, uh, posts, the patch, the uh, uh, gets, and the deletes. You know, when we're learning um, HTML, CSS, and all those kind of things, we learn about get and we learn about post. We don't really learn about put, patch, delete, options, head, or anything like that. So we're finally starting to kind of understand the potential of these verbs. And then finally, it's putting eight, uh, hypermedia controls into your API, a thing called Hadios Hypermedia as the engine of application state. But generally, like most people know REST is REST-ish. Um, and what I like to define that as is anything but full hypermedia. So when you send a response back, you're just sending the data back. You're not telling your end user, uh, hey, here's your user object. You might be interested in knowing that their profile is this URL. If you need to update their information, you can pass this URI. If you need to delete them, you can pass this URI, things like that. 99.9% um, .9 of APIs generally rest this, and that is totally cool. I used to be a, um, a, a stickler for like, you have to have hypermedia. You have to have um, your, your URIs embedded into your objects. And really at this point, like if your data is the way you want it to be, 
and it's getting the job done and it's making money, that's what counts. Anything after that is super duper cool, but we're fine right now with just getting people onto using the right status codes, using the right verbs and things like that. So this is what like a restish might uh, response might look like if you get again Star Wars. If you're not a Star Wars person, it's going to be really painful for you, and I'm terribly sorry. If you are a Star Wars person, then um, we should be friends after this. Um, rest is, you know, this is kind of going back to um, kind of like the level one of of uh, the 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 rest pyramid of greatness, where yeah, we're we're not using the right verb here. We're saying get characters. And then we're passing an action where we're saying, actually, we want to create this character. Um, and then we have to dig through the request body here um, to go ahead and actually create Luke Skywalker with all of his information. No hypermedia, no links, no URIs or anything or with this object. Another one might be like get star dash wars dash characters rather than just using starwars.com slash API slash characters or something like that. As you can see, the response is a little bit more detailed. So we're getting kind of closer to a better REST response. Uh, but our URI definitely kind of needs some work here. The biggest one of all, the one that you'll see myself, Phil Sturgeon, and other people complain about online all the time is setting a 200 OK with an error body. Um, we This is like a cardinal sin when it comes to developing. And if I find your API has this, I will hop on a plane, buy you a beer, um, steal your laptop and fix this for you. Uh, there are certain error codes in the HTTP specification for errors. So sending a 200 OK with an error body is, is probably one of the worst things you could possibly do. This is not restish at all. This is actually like anti-rest in all respects. Um, so like I said, REST is representational state transfer. Um, it is theorized in a doctoral thesis by a gentleman named Roy Fielding back in 2000, and it has six architectural constraints to it. One is that there's a client-server architecture. So there's a client and a server generally somehow separated from each other, but with monolithic applications that we're building today. It kind of all builds back together, but generally you have a client who can make a request to a server to get data and the server will send it back to your client. Number two is statelessness. And what that means is that once your request is finished and a response is sent, uh, my server will not really remember what kind of request that you made when you make the next one. Um, all I'm gonna do is show you what the current state of the database is and return that to you. If you make a post, put or patch request, the subsequent get request that comes back will be updated to that. Um, but if you pass filters, if you pass any sort of limits or anything into your URIs, that stuff stays with you and you need to remember it. My server won't really care about that after we send a response back. Cacheability is number three. Um, get requests can be cached all across the world through DNS servers and things like that. So we want to make sure that, um, that when we're when we're making these responses, we can cache them so that way we can kind of limit the the um, the hit that the server is going to take if you have a, a high availability system. Um, a layered system as well, like we don't just want it to be, we want it to be able to be distributed across the world. We, we don't want just be one single server in one single part of the world. We want to make sure we can pass it all the way around. Number five, code on demand. This is this is an older one. You can tell this is this is pretty old because at one point there was a uh, one of the the constraints was that we were able to send a JavaScript over the wire in your response. So that way, if you had like an HTML application, we could dynamically generate JavaScript to do uh, to have actions on buttons based on what you requested. Obviously, we don't do that anymore. Um, but the biggest one is the uniform interface. So like I just said, client service uh, server architecture, they're independent of each other, things like iOS, web, Android, all independent implementations of our actual API. Statelessness, our server maintains intrinsic resource state, the client maintains extrinsic state, um, and is responsible for passing state to the server, filters, limits, um, any sort of search criteria, things like that. We may log it on the server, but really ultimately we don't remember that kind of thing. Cacheability, we wanna make sure that uh, clients and intermediaries can cache responses. 
Um, one rule is that responses must implicitly or explicitly define themselves as cash flow, non cash flow, and they can use that through a cash control header, which we'll look at in a little bit. Um, the layered system. So, you know, a big popular thing right now is throwing an application behind a load balancer where, you know, depending on where the request is coming from across different parts of the world, we may, the load balancer may direct your traffic to if you're in Australia, Japan, you know, it may send you to a Singapore data server center. If you're making a request in America, depending on where you are in America, we may go to US East one. If that's down, like it usually is, we may send you to US West one or US East two, somewhere like that. So as long as your, your application can be pushed behind a proxy or a load balancer, you are uh, checking off layered system here. This is the one that is kind of talking is uh, old and silly code on demand, ability to send code on demand such as JavaScript. Uh, now, I think most people would consider that kind of like a security concern, and it absolutely is, because you never know what uh, your client is going to do with this code once they get it. So really, we consider this one optional. But the last one is the uniform interface, and this is what really kind of gets you towards that last step of the REST pyramid of greatness. Uh, we have resource identification requests. Um, we manipulate the resources through the representations um, in the data structures that we send back. We send back self-descriptive messages because this API is not uh, is not watched 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we want to make sure that when we send back errors, it's not just uh, there is an error, but rather we want to make sure, hey, this happened. Here's why it happened. This is what you can do to either fix it, mitigate it, or um, have another action happen. And last one, again, hypermedia adds the engine of application state, Hadios which are the links that we send back with our responses, pointing people into a new direction in case they want to uh, update a resource, create a new resource, delete a resource, or dive deeper into that resources uh, relationships. So that's a lot, let's take a quick break. So the good news though is that the last one of those six, um, hypermedia is one where people usually struggle with rest and it's, it's fairly fixable. So when we're, we're going to talk about the links here in a little bit, but we want to talk about some concepts first. Cores, hypermedia, authentic, authentication versus authorization. Uh, so show of hands that I can't really see. Who has ever struggled with cores? Like, it's terrible. Um, Abby, you're just right there in the middle of my screen, so I can just see this. You have not struggled with cores because your hand did not go up. And I can tell you when it does, um, you're going to want a really stiff drink because it is painful, painful. Uh, cores stands for cross-origin resource sharing. It's a mechanism to determine uh, if a remote origin is allowed to access the your server, their assets, or their data. Um, so generally, when we think about cores, it's it, it would be me, a, a good cores request would be me going to my new next door neighbor and say, hey, do you have some flour? I want to make bread. They're going to kind of suss me out. Am I am I a neighbor? Am I a threat? Am I, am I, do I even know what I'm asking for? This kind of thing. That's really what cores is um, versus going to my kitchen to get flour that I have. Um, We've already determined that I'm allowed to do that. It's my house. I'm allowed to do whatever I want to in my house. That's the rules. But going next door to ask for things, that's where we start kind of doing awkward handshakes and sussing people out. Um, to kind of actually see what a cores request looks like, we have our client and we have our server. So um, before anything happens, the client's going to send a request to the server under the options header. The options header is basically saying, hey, server, what am I allowed to do? Um, the server is going to come back and say, uh, with a 204 no content, it's going to say, hey, here's what you're allowed to do. On this endpoint, slash doc here, you're allowed to make a post, you're allowed to make a get, and you're allowed to make an options. That's it. So if I try to make a put, patch, or delete on this endpoint, uh, the server is going to throw a 500 and say, no, you're not allowed to do that, or 400, depending on how they code it up. Um, and then the, the server is also going to give us a few extra um, little pieces of information. The origin, the access control allow origin header, basically means that the request must come 
um, from this uh, URL. So we're saying, hey, we're making a request from foo.example. If we then try and make a request from foobar.example, the server is going to say, we didn't agree to this. This is not cool. I do not want you to, yeah, I'm not going to allow requests from, from this to happen if you just try and do it after you make the options request. Uh, the next one is also the access control allow headers. These are headers that the server is saying, hey, listen, like when you make your request, super cool. I need these headers on your request. It's kind of like one of those things where if you're reading a job application, um, it says, you know, number one, you're going to be a developer, number two, this, number three, this, number four. Please reference um, Spider Man in your cover letter to make sure that you're paying attention. This is kind of what the allow access control allow headers is doing. It's saying, hey, I want you to put this X ping other header in your request for no other reason. I want to make sure you're understanding what's going on. Say, okay, cool. And then it also says you're allowed to do this uh, uninterfered. I believe that's for one week, seven days. Uh, math was never my strong suit. So, okay, cool, awesome. So when we come back, we make our, we're allowed to make a post. So we make a post. We go ahead and throw our headers on there. They requested that we put X King other content type, put both of those on there. Um, and then we also set the origin to make sure it matches and we get a 200 okay. That's, that is the entire core's handshake in a very condensed form. Um, the biggest ones you'll always see is, is like access control out origin, not matching. So a lot of people put the star as their thing. Local development, that's fine. When you get to production, you really do want to keep it as granular as possible. So that way you're not just having your API uh, door wide open to the world. Um, and we'll take questions at the end too. It's kind of hard when there's like no one to just yell at me and say, hey, I have a question. Um, so if you have a question, um, real fat, if you, I'll, I'll totally hang out for the happy hour uh, drinks thing, or you can find me on Twitter, my little Twitter things at the bottom there. And I love nerding out about this. So feel free to shoot me a tweet or just hang out for a little bit later and we'll totally talk about then. So hypermedia as the engine of application state, this is the one that trips everybody up. Um, it's really better described as links and discoverability. Um, think of it as a map to your API. Um, if you go to a new city and a new part of the country, the world, doesn't matter, what's one of the first things you do when you get there? You make sure you have internet and then you download a map from Google Maps, Apple Maps, MapQuest, wherever, uh, so that we have at least a point of reference as to like where are certain things. And usually it's like, where is the grocery store? Where is the post office? Where is the liquor store? Where is the Ikea? Things like that. Um, Hadios is kind of your the map to your API for other people. Because especially the first time someone's making a request to your API, they they may just be doing the most basic request possible to kind of figure out what they can do. And if you're giving them a map back, it makes things a lot easier. So if we look at um, what an actual Hadios response will look like, so um, we're hitting API users, we're passing a few um, headers, content type, we're saying we want this back in JSON. Uh, we have an E tag, which is an MD5 string. And what that is, is we take the response, we MD5 it, shove it into the E tag. And then what we can do is when we get a subsequent request to the same users, if they pass the E tag with their request, we can do a comparison if they match, then I don't have to make a new request. I can just return back a cached response instead, um, which is pretty super cool. And then we also say, you yeah, know, this is cacheable for one hour because we assume that within one hour, a Star Wars character is either gonna uh, be born, die, change into a Sith. It's, it gets messy after a while. But so we have two users right here. We have Luke Skywalker and we have Anakin Skywalker. So this is just a generalized get users. Uh, but you may want to know more about Luke. You may want to know more about uh, Anakin. So I tell you, hey, um, if you want to find out more about this person, the relationship in the links is back on the self, which is just kind of a mirror of this person. You can get to this endpoint through uh, API users slash two, and you're allowed to make a get request to this endpoint. So then when we do that, cool. 
now you kind of get uh, some more information about Anakin Skywalker. He was a general. He's a star pilot. He was a youngling slayer. He's a pod racer. He was affiliated with the Jedi, the Galactic Republic. Um, but then we also have more links below as well. Let's say you want to learn more about the affiliations of this of this person. We can we have a link right there for you. Let's say you want to know more about the roles that he played during the um, Clone Wars. You can totally get into that as well. Let's say we need to update him um, to add a new affiliation. We can make a put request uh, to his endpoint and update the data that way. So this is all Hadeos's links, and it's a map to what you can do next on your API. So authentication. Um, authentication is basically who are you? Um, if you think about the Who song, Who Are You? That plays in my mind all the time when I think about authentication. Um, a few different authentication strategies that are out there, things like HTTP basic, a username, password, things like API keys, randomly generated. Um, ge the downside is that it's really, that's only authentication, because uh, after that, then you need to find the user and figure out what they're authorized to do. Uh, a bane to a lot of developers is OAuth. Um, if you haven't touched OAuth before, or like you have something like a Laravel Socialite, then you're super duper lucky to never have had to like just straight code against OAuth itself. If you have coded against OAuth, then uh, we should have a beer and commiserate because it's, it is terrible. Uh, but of these three, OAuth is probably the most powerful of them all and probably the most secure of them all. So if you're building a new API um, and you need to know both authentication and authorization of your users, OAuth is probably your best bet. If you just want to generate API keys and just authenticate your users and give them carte blanche to your endpoints, API keys is totally cool. Um, especially if you have, have like a, a kind of like a free range API, like a, a Star Wars, a Marvel, um, an Elephants API here. I don't, you know, no one really cares what you're authorized to do there. Um, we really just want to make sure you are who you say you are. So that way no malicious people are trying to gain access to the API. Um, authentication versus authorization, though. Authentication says you are who you, you say you are. Um, so when I, if I get pulled over, I give the police officer my license. I'm authenticating that I am who I say I am. Authorization says I'm allowed to do what I'm trying to do. Again, when I give him my driver's license, um, uh, the authorization is that I am allowed to be driving a car, not counting whatever he's pulling me over for, but I am allowed to operate said motor vehicle. So that's where authentication versus authorization takes place. Whew. All right. So moving right down the list, we have the URIs are next. Uh, the URIs are the entry point of your API. This is kind of one of the first things people are going to uh, interact with when they are building you, when they're uh, connecting to your API. So if you think about like using Postman or PAW, curl, HTTP, uh, HTT Pi, things like that. The, the, the most tactile thing that they're going to be typing is your URIs. So you really want to kind of think through how you build them. A few best practices about URIs, resource-based instead of actions-based. They're pluralized. Hyphen instead of underscore. So that way it's clear that the hyphen is there and the underscore isn't some sort of weird ASCII character. Um, your URIs should describe relationships. And if it's a public API that's out there for consumption, you should use UUIDs instead of the auto-incrementing database ID. Uh, so what does resource base mean? Um, so basically it just means that instead of saying, like having your action and then whatever data you wanna return, Star Wars characters, get Star Wars characters, or create elephants, or create stuffed animals slash elephants, uh, my API is just going to be slash characters. And the top level domain is going to be the data that you're going to be getting back. So elephant.com, L-E-L-P-H-P-A-N-T.com slash. Um, you could, I, I, actually, this is kind of weird because that's in the title. So I'll just call them slash API slash uh, elephants. I've actually never had to think about that before. But then, so that tells you exactly what you're going to be interacting with, which is a list of elephants. And then after that, if I do slash UUID, that's a very specific elephant. 
If I do a, a conference one, let's say elephants.com slash sunshine PHP, then I, I'm expecting that I'm going to get all of the elephants that have come back from sunshine PHP right here. If I do elephant slash or uh, dot com slash blue, I expect all my blue little elephants to come back. I have a few of them laying around, so I'd expect three or four. Um, and so that would make sense logically as to what I'm going to get back in my data when I see the URI. It also allows you to manage relationships in the resource collection as well, which we'll look at in just a second. Um, but so some good ones and some bad ones here. So good api.starwars.com slash characters. Um, not so good one, get underscore characters. Uh, we want to rely on the, the HTTP verb. We want to get the underscore out of here. Um, if you were going to do this, a hyphen would be much better. Um, if it's a public facing API for a company that you're making money for, you want to use a UUID here, mostly because if it's an automatic permitting ID, I, as a competing developer, can just kind of sit here on api.starwars.com characters one and write a script to just increment up every successful response and figure out the size of your database, um, which then means I can, might be able to go to my investors and say, hey, this person over here only has 500 users. I have 2,000 users. I probably stand a better chance of being successful because I have more users in my database. Give me more money, please. Um, Phil Surgeon wrote a really good article about kind of the hiding your data sets behind UUIDs. You don't need to use the full UUID. In fact, I would just chop off the first eight characters. And that's random enough that most people will never be able to, to guess it. Uh, some URI, or URIs that describe relationships. So we have a, a fancy pants bank. So we have, um, after we authenticate and authorize a user, we have um, their accounts. They might have a checking account and a savings account. Um, and if they want to just see one of those, they might might just return uh, slash one for just a checking account. If they need to create a new account, uh, they can post two accounts. It's all the same resource collection here, um, which makes it kind of easy to think through what are you allowed to do. So accounts and forget and post, get all the accounts available, create a new account to the resource collection. Anything with an ID after it means it's a single uh, item from the collection coming back, but we still keep it pluralized because we're pulling one item out of the entire collection. Uh, but then if you think about through, let's say they have a savings account and we wanna go into more detail with that as well. Um, generally, you can only have one savings account per bank. I'm not sure how the rules are um, over where y'all are from, but here in America, generally you only have one savings account per bank. So we might have an account slash one slash savings account and we can get their information. If they don't have a savings account, we can create one. If they need to update it, delete it, so on and so forth. But looking at this logically, we can see that the savings account belongs to this account, which belongs to the user that we have authenticated. That's what we're talking about when we use resource-based URIs to describe our collections. So moving right along into the verbs, the verbs, the verbs, the verbs. We have uh, six that you will most likely interact with on a daily basis as a developer. Five, really, because the options one is done for you through the browser. So you will very rarely ever send your own options requests. Get, get requests a re representation of a specified resource. Uh, there's a few rules around get requests. Um, Generally, no request body. The response will have a body. It is safe and indepotent. Uh, safe meaning that you can make this, um, is that when you make a request, nothing about it will change. So it will, um, you, you will never have to worry about data changing when you make a GET request. If you're doing any sort of data manipulation and you're using GET, you're using the wrong verb. It's indepotent, which means that it won't change over um, over multiple subsequent requests, and it's cacheable across the world's DNS servers and through browsers. So if you send a, a response with a list of characters, you can tell it to be cached for an hour and um, move on from there, or you can tell it not to be cached, but it is cacheable by design. What a response might look like for a, um, 
for a get request. Again, you may or may not have this data key. I prefer not to use it, but some people do. Um, and then you're gonna have your the data. So this is a generalized get request. We're not drilling into a specific user, which is why I, I personally re respond with as little data as possible, instead of relying on these links to kind of point users into a direction they may wanna go. Uh, the reason is, is because if let's say, I'm only returning two characters here, but Star Wars has 1500 characters. And so if you had to send 1500 characters with all their uh, relevant data, uh, their relationships through things like their ships, their planets, their affiliations, their roles, that's gonna be a massive request, even if you try and paginate it down. Um, so instead, I just send you the most basic information possible. You have an ID, the name, and then where can you go after that? So this is generally what a GET request is going to look like. Uh, the status code most associated with GET requests is 200 OK. Uh, we're setting a content type for saying we want application JSON, and it is application JSON. We're sending the E tag, so that way, if we do get a subsequent request within the one hour mark, we can just compare the tags and know that the data is the same and just send back a uh, redirect response back to the same data rather than fetching it again. Post is probably the second most common one people are familiar with. This is one that creates a resource. The request is gonna have a body. The response may have a body. This is a very, I don't wanna say contentious topic, but it's definitely one of those ones where some people uh, really like to adhere to the REST um, white paper. Some people kind of go their other way. It's not safe. Obviously, when you make a, uh, a post request, it is going to change the uh, data on the server. So it is not considered safe. It's not indepotent, which means that if you make subsequent re uh, uh, post requests within a quick succession, you're probably going to start overwriting data as well. It is cacheable if freshness headers are provided. And we'll look at those uh, when we get to the headers here in a little bit. What a post request may look like, we're gonna to post to our endpoint with data that we have decided that we want to accept. Um, we return a 201 created is our most common uh, status code. Sometimes you can do 202 accepted as well, but 201 created is generally the preferred one here. Uh, you do pass both a content location and a location header in your response. So that way your uh, client knows where to go to get this data. This is what it would look like if we don't send a, re a response body back with our data or with our request. Um, and then we also wanna say, hey, when was the last time this was modified? This is kind of our way around uh, the whole safe and impotent issue with post. So we might say, hey, this was created in March uh, 2021. So at this exact time, 12 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time, so if it's coming um, after this, you might want to look at your data, see if it's the same, see if it's been different, um, and make your requests accordingly. Um, go away. Everyone go away. So put is an update or create data on the server. Um, requests will have a body. Successful responses should not or will not have a body. It's not safe, but it is indemnitant because we can look at the request coming through and we're just gonna constantly be updating the same record over and over and over and over and over again. So it doesn't, there's no real worry about creating multiple records of the same data, but it is not cacheable. Um, status codes you may see here, you may see a 201, you may see a 202, and you may see a 204. Um, all of those are perfectly acceptable. Although I would kind of argue that 204 is probably your last resort of a status code here. And kind of the same thing, again, we're gonna pass our, our body of data. Um, we're gonna tell it where you can find this new user or this updated user. And then we're gonna pass a last modified date as well. So that way we understand when was this data last modified? Did it change since then? This kind of thing. Patch, this is the one where people get kind of confused with put and patch. So put is, uh, patch is the complete update of a resource on a server put is just a, you're changing just a little bit of the data. This is probably the most 
bastardized part of software development out there because a lot of people just operate all under put. And there's nothing really wrong with that. Um, this is one of those granular rest things where it's like, yeah, you're not wrong, but um, you're also like, you could be doing it maybe a little bit more according to the rest spec. It all depends how you really feel about this. As long as your documentation is good and as long as your documentation is clear, then if you just want to operate with put like I do, it's totally fine. But your request will have a body. Your response may have a body. Um, it's not safe and it's not indepotent. It's cacheable and may be restricted via headers as well. We may actually be able to tell um, the, the client, actually, you're not allowed to update this resource with particular headers that we'll look at in just a second. Um, 200, 204, you could do a 2002, you could do a 201 as well. Um, these are all acceptable status codes. Um, this one, so we are just kind of updating, actually, I got these backwards. This one should have been the put where we're just updating a call sign. And the one before is where we're updating the entire object. And the last one is delete. The last real the last one that you're going to really interact with is delete, and that's a complete removal of a resource on a server. Ideally, you'll have a some sort of delete of that timestamp on your database table, so that way you're not truly hard deleting data. But you know, some people like to live in a uh, a little bit more of a wild life than I do. Being 35, I have learned that I can't take risks like I used to. And so, when you delete something, I just say, "Here's a timestamp when it was deleted." But if you want to hard delete things, go for it. Your request may have a body. Your response may have a body. It's not safe. It's not indepotent. Um, it, it, we probably will want to cache it, uh, tell it that it's cacheable if we provide the right uh, headers. So that way we're not making the same delete request over and over and over and over again. Um, and you may see a 200, a 202, a 204 status code come back as well. Um, what you might see here, so. You know, we're going to delete this user. Um, you could just pass the URI here if you want to pass all their data to make sure it's all deleted as well. You can do that. Um, you might get a 204 no content. You may get a 200 OK with a message body that says resource deleted, something like that. Both of these are perfectly acceptable. I tend to err on to the 204 no content side. Um, but every so often, I will pass the 200 OK with resource was deleted and some sort of confirmation um, allowing the user to know that their data was deleted in some shape, form or fashion. So that way they're not wondering what happened or making subsequent requests or anything like that. The last true header that you'll run into is the options header. So remember we talked about cores. This is what the browser will send to an API server before anything else ever happens. It's not going to have a request body. It's not going to have a response. The response will have a body or it'll have headers more likely. It is safe. It's indemptant. It's not cacheable. Nothing will ever change on your server if you just continually hammer away options requests. And it's just going to return a 204 with subsequent information about uh, what you're allowed to do on the server. So if we have just a, a, a plain options request to API users, we're going to say, you know, you're allowed to do options, get, head, and post. Um, you know, here's what the caching strategy is. We have a max age of 604, 800 seconds, so quite a long time. The last time this request was made was on this particular date. And you may also just want to know some information about the server or anything else. If we have a cores request, it's the same type of thing, except for a little bit more information because now we're going to add these access control request method and request headers and any other sort of access control headers along with our request. So that way we know exactly what we're allowed to do. So that's what the options header does. So moving right along into the status codes. There we go. Uh, what are they? Is that they are numbers and phrases to give quick context for a request. Um, so there's five types of status codes. There's the 100s, the 200s, the 300s, the 400s, and the 500s. The 100s are informational. Um, at, in all of my time doing this and all of my time blathering on API podcasts, 
I don't think I've ever run into a 100 status code. Um, and if you have, I would love to hear about how you found it because this stuff is really interesting to me. Uh, the 200s are success codes. Um, if whatever you did worked, we want to send back a 200 in some form, shape, or fashion. 300s are redirections. So we want to make sure if you're doing something when the resource is moved or is temporarily elsewhere, we want to make sure we tell the, the client, hey, you're looking in the wrong place. Here's where you really need to go. Uh, the 400s are client errors. These ones are very common for people to run into. Uh, these are errors that the client has committed that the server is basically saying, that's a no-no, please don't do that. And the last one is 500s, the server's errors, which are um, things that happen on the server. Maybe the, there's a bug in the code or the database just magically tipped over or something like that. But if you get a 500, it's not your fault, it's the server's fault. Uh, they are, uh, Amanda Folson, who you may or may not know from uh, years and years and years of developer evangelism um, and overall spicy memes. She had this great line in a talk that I shamelessly took, which is they're not all Pokemon. So you don't need to use every single status code in the book. You wanna use the ones that make the most sense to your API. Uh, there's no reason to go find a reason to use 418 on a teapot other than you just like to have some fun with people. Um, very rarely do you need to use 451 uh, censored for legal reasons, although there is a certain use case right now in a certain part of the world as to why you would be doing that. Um, and you don't need to like go grain or through all the 400s and the 500s as well. 500 server error, you actually don't want to expose why why was your why did you respond with a 500? You just want to say, hey, it was a server error, eh, go away, and then fix it quietly. If you expose as to why is a server error, why did that happen? That could be an attack vector that um, a, a malicious person may look to uh, exploit. So you do want to kind of be careful with these status codes. Great power, great responsibility. So 200, okay, it's probably one of the most common ones people know. Uh, everything worked out as we expected. You can use it on, you should use it on a get request. You can use it on a put request. You can use it on a patch. You can definitely use it for options. You can definitely use it for delete as well. 201 created, uh, when you make a request to create a resource on the server, uh, it was accepted and we're good. Everything was created as it should be. Post and put are the ones you're gonna see this for. 202 accepted. Uh, the use case for this one is, let's say that you are, streaming a CSV up to your uh, server and you want to create 5,000 records off of the CSV, that's going to take a little bit of time. I might respond with a 202 accept and say, hey, I got your request. Makes perfect sense. Everything checks out. It's going to take me a little bit of time to get through this. So here's your 202 accepted so you know it's going to do its thing. And then probably down the line in the code, I'll send an email out that says, hey, your CSV was completely ingested, all of your data was created, you're good to go. But this basically says, whatever you're requesting to be done, I accept it, I will do it, just maybe not this very second. 204, no content. Um, deletes and gets where you might see it, mostly on deletes. Uh, if you delete some content, you obviously have no content to show. So why would we send back no content or uh, an empty response body when say we could just send back a 204 of no content and have it widely accepted as um, everything worked as we expected it to. 206, partial content. You might see this on a get request. Again, if you're making a, uh, if you're trying to stream down 5,000 rows into a CSV, I might say, hey, here's part of your content. The rest is coming uh, in about five seconds. Let's let the server kind of uh, take a nap for a little bit. And so we'll just keep streaming 206 partial content until we get to the end and then return back a uh, 200 okay or 202 accepted, some sort of content like that. 301 move permanently. Um, this is one you'll hear a lot with SCO. If you like, let's say you move your API from uh, elephants.com slash API to api.elephants.com slash resource. If you request that slash API slash resource, I might say, hey, uh, 
it's when I had moved. So let's go. I'm going to tell you, you need to go over to um, api.elephants.com versus slash API. 304 not modified. This is the one that's going to happen with the e tags. Um, nothing's changed. We know this through cache control, through content location, the dates, the last modified. Um, one of these headers must be present on your response cache control content location e tag date expires very. And as long as one of those are, you've, you have satisfied the rest um, dogma, so to speak. And so we're basically just saying, hey, nothing has changed about this response since the last time you requested it. So instead of making my server do more work, you're good to go. 307, a temporary redirect. Um, maybe you lost, maybe someone forgot to pay the bill on your domains and you have to temporarily um, move your API to somewhere else while you try and figure out who has a credit card and why did they not buy the domain at the right time. So you might do a 307 temporary redirect to uh, a temporary location where your API may be. Uh, 308 permanent redirect. This is one where like you have permanently moved everything and you want people to know where to go. So you pass a location header that we saw with our post requests and our put requests saying, hey, this is where you need to go next. 401 unauthorized, I skipped 400 um, bad requests because everyone knows that one and it's such a, a kitchen sink of a request. 401 unauthorized means that if you're trying to do something and you don't have the authorization to do it, let's say um, I, with my bank account, try and log in to my fiance's bank account, the bank should hopefully say, um, LOL, you're not allowed to do that. Here's a 401. 403 forbidden. This may be for a number of different reasons. It may be uh, a, a great one would actually be Laravel's um, horizon or telescope in the gate policy. They have uh, an array of that you can pass of emails that uh, have access to slash telescope and slash horizon. And if you're not on one of those uh, in those arrays as your email, they will 403 forbid you from seeing that content. Um, that's a cheap way to kind of hide and for and restrict access to a certain number of people. Obviously, in your production API, you're going to want to have a much stringent process. But if someone tries to do something that they're not supposed to be doing, uh, maybe Harry Pottering it up into the uh, forbidden section of the library, uh, when Filch comes through, he's going to slap a 403 on them and tell them to get going. 409 conflict. You're going to see this one with uh, posts and um, put requests a lot where you're updating or creating data. If let's say myself and someone else is making the exact same request to an API to create a, a, a resource um, in the, we have some sort of code in our logic to make sure that the requests aren't doing the exact same thing. If they, if, and we find out that they are, we might say, hey, 409, here's a conflict. We cannot create your, your new resource at this time. Nope, this one. 4.0.10 gone. Um, after you do a delete, and let's say you keep trying to access data under that ID, we might finally say, hey, this data is gone. It's 4.0.10. It does not exist anymore. Please stop doing it. This is an error. Uh, 4.13, payload too large. You know, I just talking about streaming a 5,000 row CSV up to create users. Um, if you're a team of developers and you have money and resources, you can totally make a, an application be able to do that. If you're just a single developer, you know, trying to fight many fires with many different fire hats, uh, ingesting a 5,000 row CSV may be a little too much for you to build right now. And so you might say, hey, we can only do 500 rows. And so if you try and upload a 5,000 row CSV and it's too big, I will throw a 413 and say, hey, um, it's a little too big for me. Um, you should probably find some way to shimmy that on down. If it's a time-based restriction, then I'm gonna tell you, you're allowed to try this again after X amount of time with a retry after header. Um, but generally, I always just see it as your data set's too large, please cut it down a little bit. 14, I'm a teapot, that's just funny. Um, it was a joke uh, making a request to a, sending a request to make coffee to a teapot. And the teapot responds back with, I can't make coffee. I'm a teapot. Um, 
any API I make, I try and put this in there only because I'm a child and I think it's funny. 429, too many requests. This is one that you're probably very familiar with, um, especially with Laravel right out of the box. It has throttling mechanisms where you might be only allowed to make 60 API requests within one second, something like that. Generally, SaaS platforms with um, API, public APIs, they're going to be very tightly controlled on how many requests you're allowed to make within a certain period of time. So that way you don't accidentally knock their servers over uh, when you're doing something either not maliciously, just if it's an e-commerce like a Shopify or big commerce and you have 200,000 products, they can handle it, but not in one big request or subsequently 200,000 requests within a 30 second period. They're gonna tell you, hey, cool your heels, take a break, um, come back to us after a little bit of time and don't make so many requests. 451, unavailable for legal reasons. This is the newest status code as far as I know. Uh, it, they had to come up with it for uh, the conflicts in Syria and the Arab Spring where internet was being cut um, and denying people information. And so they came up with a status code to kind of say, hey, here's why we can't display this content because legally in that country, we're not allowed to. Um, there is, in person, I would ask to see if anyone knows what book this is based on. Um, it is Fahrenheit 451, which is all about censoring and book banning and book burning. 503, service unavailable. Um, let's say you're doing some work, you need to take your servers down for a little bit you might throw a 503 service unavailable. So that way people can't make requests and possibly do something to your data that you're not expecting to, particularly deletes, puts, patches, things like that. 505 HTTP version not supported. This is one where uh, as we're trying to move away from HTTP slash one to two and three, uh, you will start seeing HTTP one not supported anymore. And this will become a more common status code to be thrown around. Um, but basically, if you're making a request through HTTP 1 and your server does only supports 2 and 3, then you will get a 505 that says you're not allowed to do this. Whew. All right. So the headers, there's four types of headers. There's general headers, request headers, response headers, and entity headers. Uh, and this is really how you give meta information about your requests and your responses. Uh, Accept and content type, these ones go hand in hand. Accept goes on to request. You basically say, hey, when I want my data, I only want it in JSON form, or I want it in XML form or text CSV. Or if you have a specific vendor JSON flavor, GitHub has one. That's why you see the bnd.github plus JSON, because um, they decided that plain JSON is not cool enough. They want to do it their own way. So you can say, I want GitHub's flavored JSON. The response will say, cool, the content type of this is application JSON or text HTML, text CSV. Um, this allows for what's called content negotiation, where really you can pass multiple types of, uh, con of uh, content into your accept header. So you can do an application JSON, application XML, and text CSV. And in that rank, I will try and respond first with JSON. If I can't respond with JSON, I'll say, okay, uh, XML is how I'm going to respond. And if I can't do XML, I might do text CSV. And then in the response, I'll tell you, hey, you're getting text CSV back. So that way then your application, your client code knows it needs to parse the data uh, through CSV mechanisms, not through JSON tooling. Authorization. Um, this is one where you pass your bearer token, your basic token. And this is how we kind of figure out who you are and what you're allowed to do on our servers. The cache control header um, is basically how long things are allowed to be cached for. If things are allowed to be cached, should you be able to store it? Uh, when you should consider this data to be stale, when you should consider it to be fresh. Um, generally, you'll see something like max age in seconds. You'll see it at uh, 86400, which is seven days, I think. Um, and so after seven days, and we consider that the data being requested is now old and we're, we can make a new request to get fresh data. Um, or our server might say, hey, this data is changing at such a rapid pace, you should not cache it. Thinking um, 
your European audience, it might be a football match, uh, Chelsea versus Liverpool or um, Manchester United getting thrashed by literally anybody. And we the score might be changing so rapidly that we might just not want to cash that. We might want to say, hey, don't cash this because everything's changing too rapidly. So that's where you're going to see no cash or anything like that. The location, this is telling people where you, they can find their newly created resource data, uh, content location and location, they're interchangeable. E-tags, age, last modified, these are uh, kind of go with cache controls. Like I said earlier, an e-tag, uh, it's an MD5 uh, hashed string of all the data. We can do a comparison of the, of the response data to the e-tag. If it's the same, I can just send back um the not modified header and say you're good to go you may want to tell people how old this data is again uh think about like a football match where the data is going to be changing really quickly so i might say hey this data is 60 seconds old you may want to make another request to get the newest data or i might pass your last modify and say hey this is modified 60 seconds ago um you may want to make another request HTTP date is a format defined by an RFC 7231. RFCs are really boring, so I highly recommend you have a stiff drink when you read them, but they can be interesting. Content length tells you exactly how big your body is. It is represented in 8-byte bits. Um, and so if your client can only handle uh, content in a certain amount, you can go ahead and start kind of planning around how big bodies may be coming back. Um, we also want to pass language. You know, we are in a global economy these days. Not everybody speaks English. Some people speak other languages. I may want to pass back um, what language the data is actually coming back in. So that way people can kind of make plans as to translating it or anything like that. And the last one is it expires. Um, and this is, again, when does the data kind of turn stale? And when, can, when should you start making subsequent requests to get fresh data? The course headers, these are the fun ones. Access control allow origin is where are you allowed to make the request from? Access control allow credentials. These are the, uh, what credentials might you need to pass in order to make this request happen? Um, access control exposed headers. These are the headers that I expect to come back in the next request. The max age is how long you have to make this request after we do our course handshake. What methods you're allowed to do, get posts, options, and that's it, or put, patch, delete, whichever. And then what headers am I, um, am I also kind of hoping that you're going to send back or telling you, hey, you need to send back as well. So that covers all of the headers. Whew. So the last little bit of what I got to talk about is API contracts and tooling. This is something that um, I reference Phil a lot. Phil is one of my really great friends. He's almost gotten me killed like three times. So obviously we are like best friends when it comes to him and I. Um, in fact, he will readily admit that he almost got me killed once in New York City. It's great. Uh, but a concept that I've learned a lot from him and that I'm very passionate about is API contracts and the subsequent things you see here, open API, JSON schema, tooling and resources. This is going to be, I hate to use this buzz thing. Is this like a 30,000 foot? I don't know what that is in meters. Uh, look at this kind of landscape. These are more advanced topics for APIs. Um, I saw Yannick, I think I got his name right. He's in this talk somewhere too. He's really on the forefront um, along with Phil and a few others talking about this kind of stuff. So if you have questions, like he's, he's a really good resource to use as well. Um, what is an API contract? Just like a contract when you sign a job, a house, a car, uh, something with your brother when you're when you're 10 years old and he promised to give you your Legos if you hit a home run and you sign a contract. Uh, basically, what this is, is I, as a API developer, I'm basically saying, this is what my API will always look like. These are the endpoints you can access. These are the verbs you can use. This is what the data is going to look like. And I promise you, as long as this API is up and running, this is a contract that I'm going to follow. Um, it is something generally, it, it's, it says that it's something that both the provider and the consumer can agree upon, but really the consumer, if it's an external outside of your company uh, consumer, 
they don't really get to agree upon anything. This is the terms that they have to abide by. But the API provider is kind of bound to what they have put out in terms of documentation. Internally, if you're a front-end developer, an iOS developer, an Android developer, you can talk with your API developers and say, um, you know, for this user profile, I, I want the uh, roles and permissions object to be in an array, or I want this data to be present with this, um, with this response. And as the API provider, I can say, great, awesome, let's go ahead and add that to our API contract. So that way I'm expected to always provide it and the consumer knows that it will always be there. Open API is the artist formerly known as Swagger. Um, I got into a lot of trouble because I did like a meme of like the guy uh, kneeling on a grave with Swagger and Open API. Um, but this is like the current battle that we're facing online, which is words matter, naming matters. Everyone knows Open API it used to be called Swagger. People still call it Swagger, but it is now called Open API. It is under the um, umbrella of the Linux Foundation. And it's a description language that allows for documentation generation, testing, SDK generation, and more. The resulting file that you build using the Open API description language is what creates the API contract we just talked about and is, um, is something that both the server and the client, both a machine client and a human client, can reliably consume. Uh, some things you can do, so you can you can do uh, testing, you can do visualization, documentation, you can generate clients, you can do mocking, all sorts of things with Open API that are available to you um, that kind of speed up the process a little bit as well. But that is a whole other talk that um, one of us can do at some point. With a kind of look at like what is the doc the description language. So this is kind of a base open API and it's all in YAML. Uh, some people are very allergic to YAML. I actually don't really mind it all that much, but all it is is descriptions. All we're, all we're describing is information about our API. So this is a national parks API for the American National Park System. Uh, you have some contact information here if you need to talk to me. This URL does not exist, so I would not try and go there. Um, and then we describe like what servers are available to us. And then getting into the actual open API. So it describes paths and verbs all the way down. So we basically say, this is an available API endpoint, API slash national parks, and you're allowed to make a get request on it. And the responses, so you're, you can get a 200 okay. And then we can expect that these are the properties that you're gonna have. So this is gonna be a very long document. It's gonna be about 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 lines depending on your API. All of it's gonna kind of come together to allow people to have auto-generated documentation, SDKs, mocking, and other tooling that allow for easier uh, API consumption. JSON schema is another one that's starting to make waves only because it also is under the Linux uh, Foundation umbrella. And this is one that allows you to uh, kind of validate and annotate your JSON documents. So if you have any sort, if you're sending back JSON as a response type, you want to make sure that your integers are integers or strings are strings. JSON schema allows for that kind of thing. Uh, so this is a quick example. So we have um, some metadata up here matching the drafts of the JSON schema that we might be using. And then we have the properties that we're going to validate against country name, postal code, region, locality. We expect all these things to be strings and we expect locality, region, and country name to be um, in the object at all times. And then we expect that if street address is there, you should have post office box. And if street address is there as well, you should also have extended address. And all JSON scheme is gonna do is validate that your response matches what you say should be there. Uh, so what's the difference open API versus JSON schema is really not a whole lot anymore. Uh, 3.1 in the open API world kind of worked through some of our last minor issues and open API and JSON schema play nice together now. So these are two really robust and powerful tools that will only take your API to the very next level um, and really give you some really awesome uh, testing with linting and things like that, mocking, um, as well as validation, both in and out of your APIs. Um, 
So some tooling for APIs, uh, Postman for HTTP testing and making requests. Paw is another one. I per I really like uh, both of them. I used to use Paw and then I went back to Postman. They're both really great. If you're more of a CLI person, uh, HTTP Pi is a great one. Insomnia is another one as well. It's not as feature rich as Pa or Postman, but it's getting there. Postwoman is the open source alternative to Postman. Um, I've not tried it yet, so I can't tell you how good and or how not so good it is, but it's definitely, if you're more of an open source person, it's definitely the thing to check out. Stoplight Studio, um, in order to make all that YAML less painful, Stoplight has come up with an application called Studio that allows you to uh, design and document your APIs really easily. Spectral uh, is kind of like the, the tool I use for linting my, my open API documentation. Um, Dread.io is a JavaScript test runner for you to test your APIs. And then JQ is a CLI, JSON, um, gives you things like map, filter, slice, all those things that we're used to in the PHP JavaScript world. Now you get them on the command line as well. Few last resources, uh, APIs you won't hate. There's a book, a blog, a podcast. Um, I, there's the API Evangelist online as at API Evangelist. He runs a fantastic blog. He's more about the API governance, uh, but he has some really interesting concepts and topics. There's Nordic APIs. Uh, they host an event, a huge API conference up in Sweden, as well as a really interesting blog. Uh, so people to follow, Phil, I've mentioned him a lot. Uh, he does a lot with open APIs. He has a lot with trees these days. It's kind of weird. Um, and he's generally a very loud person. Ben Hutton, uh, he is a British friend. He is the lead on Jason's schema right now. Ken Lane is API evangelist. Daryl Miller is on the OpenAPI TSC. Mike Emmonson, Arnott Laura, and Mike Ralphson are all just, if you want to learn anything about APIs, any one of these people are great to follow. Um, so I'll leave it up here for just a quick second, just in case you need to write things. And I'll send the slides around afterwards too, but um, definitely worth some Twitter follows here. And that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to send me a tweet, send me an email. Uh, if you want to listen to a podcast about APIs, they're making it right now without me as I figure out my life. Uh, but you can go to APIs you want to um, And every like five years, I write a blog post about this stuff. So thank you. Um,